All right, I have invited my friend Jen to talk with you about this book, Finding Me by Viola Davis, because we both absolutely love her work. And this is an incredibly raw book and we're reading it together as Oprah suggested, buy one, buy one, one for your friend. Now, Jen, you're in London. I'm all the way at the bottom of Australia and we're still reading it together. And what chapter yes. have you read up to? I've got up to chapter three. Actually, I think I've just started chapter four. Yeah, yeah. I can't put it down. It's very... um. It's such an easy read. Like you really just feel like you're just there with her having a chat. Definitely. I mean, for me, I'm a, I, well, I don't know if you want to call it lazy, but I've got the audio book. So <laughs> and having that as experience, it's, it's very easy. And it's one of those books so far that you just want to continue to listen. You want to listen all the time. It's, so, her, yeah. it's her voice, isn't it? I think it is actually. Yes, it yeah. is read it is read by her. But she's so, got a beautiful, warm voice. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And despite so far in the chapters, despite the hardships that she's gone through, again, just her voice, it, you know, yeah, it, she just flows it through and you kind of feel what she went through. You yeah. do, you do. Now, yes. it's funny because it, straight away, the first two words in chapter one, which we can't say, and it it rhymes with cock tucker mother <laughs> sucker. Um, <laughs> and I could hear her voice yelling it down the street to those boys that would chase her yes. when she was a little girl. I was quite I was quite surprised when it started out like that. And I have to say, I went to a play recently and it was kind of heavy like that as well. And it really catches you straight away because whenever you see her in her movies or, or whatever, she's always got a sort of regal thing about her. So, yeah, she is regal. But then when you see her fire up. So did you watch her in How to Get Away with Murder? You know what? I haven't. Oh, well, when she fires up, you see that face and you you know that she's... And also the one where she played the singer, Ma... Oh, God, now I've forgotten. Oh, Ma, gosh, yes, that, the, the, the musical. Um, yeah, and she can be ugly. She can yes. really turn it ugly. And she and you can see that she's not afraid to no, show that ugly no, side. She doesn't no. have to be beautiful all the time. And that's, and that's, and that's what makes what her amazing. And that's what I like so far about this book um, is the fact that she's just very open and, you know, there's no ears and graces about it. She's just yeah. being real and, you know, she's it's talking about her experience and it's yes. really, she's really strong in saying it. Um, but obviously it must be, you know, when you, because we didn't know what she was, you know, we didn't know her childhood and her growing up. And obviously we've always seen her, on screen so you always have a perception of what she's like but I didn't realize what background she came from no. and the struggles that she has and I think it's very inspiring especially for black people to know that you might have hardships growing up but you can change your direction you can yeah. excel and nothing sh can get in yeah. the way you are strong in in what you believe basically yeah. and she wasn't just poor she says she was pole yeah pole and, yes. and I heard Oprah talking about saying that word pole which I'd never heard before is it a shorter word because you're poorer than poor possibly I think it's an American African-American thing yeah so she's pole really like like poor it's like really exaggerating like not just because yeah. you've got people in England and I'm sure in Australia, and you look at them, they might consider themselves poor, but they're on benefits. They've still got a roof yeah. over their head. Like you said in some of the chapters that we will go through, they, there's no way that anyone's living like that who are classed as poor unless you're um, homeless. Yeah. But, yeah. but to be still living in that apartment mm. and the standards of that apartment, it does, I'm sure that does not happen here in England to that extent or in Australia. No, no. So she was born, um, I've got my notes here. She was born in 1965. So if you imagine, so you're in London, imagine 1970-ish, you know, would London have had areas like as poor as what 
Central <sighs> Falls and Caroline Springs and all that work? I don't know. To be honest with you, because I was born a <clears throat> couple of years after, but I didn't have that experience that she had. You know, from, the, from what my parents have told me when they came to England in the 60s, um, they didn't, it, you know, it's very difficult to get, you know, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. So it was very difficult to get a place. So those that came from the Caribbean, especially that's the only experience that I can talk about. I'm not so sure about, you know, those that came from Africa, but those that came from the Caribbean, it would maybe be the wealthy Caribbean um, person who would have purchased a home. And what they did is then they rented out the rooms basically. Yeah. So um, I know that when my mum came to this country, I mean, she came from, uh, you know, they, she lived in a house, you know, she wasn't rich, but she lived in a house. They had, you know, a toilet and bathroom inside the house and, you know, they had their own bedrooms and everything. But when she came to England, she was very surprised because the first thing she did, she obviously walked into the house and then she said to my dad, um, you know, he took her to the room and, he, and she goes, well, is this it? <laughs> you know, because she could believe that she had to share toilets and bathroom and the kitchen and, the, you know, with, with other families. With, there. So that was a new experience for her, but yeah. she never talked about no electricity. She never, you know, I know it's one bedroom, so obviously it had a bed and whatever means yeah. that you would have, but I would not have, no, I don't think, I don't know, but from live, speaking to other Caribbean um, elders, I've not heard them living in the conditions like this, not yeah. at all. No. So... I um I love that you know she went back so she was born in um on Singleton Plantation in St Matthews in South Carolina same place that um Eartha Kitt was also born in that same town and I and she's actually she's actually gone back and bought that original house did you know that oh that's amazing because yeah. it got me to be honest with you because like I said you know she's my age group and she said was two generations away from slavery and that kind of like kind of I was like that's just so close you know Check um, this out. see that it says the, the above is the house where I was born 1965 it is the birthplace of my story today on my 55th year of life I own it all of it wow may that's you live amazing. long enough to know why you were born so there that's where she was born um and this is this is another picture of the plantation yeah so when she was an infant then they moved to central falls rhode that's island that's right yes I looked, up, I looked up photos and it's just nothing special you know Rick, really today nice. yeah nothing special really um, and i was looking up some of the statistics and even in 2000 it is it was two, in year 2000 it was about 50 percent 57% white, 40 something percent Hispanic, and about 5% black. And that's in wow. 2000. And then the rest is made up of all other sorts of things. And it's interesting. And I thought of you when I was reading this bit, that boy that was picking on her, the leader yes. who was black himself, but he didn't call himself black. He said, no, I'm Portuguese. He didn't see himself as black. And I thought that was really interesting. To that it's sad because again, yeah. it again stems from slavery, you know, and I suppose colorism. You had different rankings, so you had like the blacks, or you would have the mulattoes, and you there's all these terminologies as well because you've got the ones that were the slaves. Um, so the darker the skin you were, you'd be on the field. The lighter skinned you were, you would be in the house. So, you know, again, it was the masters that did the divide. Um, and I suppose not just, you know, uh, black people, but the Asians. And, you know, it's just sort of like England have really sort of made this colorism and hierarchy is that, you know, the whiter you are, the better you are. And that falls a lot across a lot of other cultures as well, which is really sad. Yeah. And, you know, and there are people that um, 
I mean, I was quite blessed because in the area that I, I lived, you know, we was just like a family. So there was, you know, there was a lot of Caribbeans. Yes, we had a few Africans, a couple of Indians or Asians and Pakistanis and, um, you know, mostly whites, I would yeah. say. But we were such a close knit community that I, I can't, you know, we we'll do name calling, but I can't recall facing any kind of outward racism. But I do know that there's a lot of people of colour um, that don't feel proud of their colour. They've, they've got insecurity about it. And I think even today, it, it still stands that way. Well, I'm I wonder for that little boy, because it was only such a small... He wanted to detach himself from that colour because yeah. he was yeah. mixed. Yeah. He, was, he was half Portuguese, half African. Yeah. But I suppose, you know, he might have had more wavier hair and not, you know, the coily... Yeah throw beautiful hair uh, maybe he might be in a, a bit fair skinned but he just didn't want to relate and that could be because maybe he saw the treatment of of his whoever was af of African heritage he yeah. most probably saw the treatment of that and tried to get away from that so he obviously presented himself that he was more superior than Viola and I wonder how he feels today yeah you know, I wonder how he feels today because you do have that, you do have rankings, you know, it still happens in, 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 in many countries, even they, they do, you know, everyone's got this thing about mixed race and how it's, you know, okay, when back now, you know, back then when I'll be, when you're watching TV and the adverts, rather than using somebody my complexion or darker, um, they would always use mixed race people. Yeah. Um, again, because they, they, you know, the fairer you are, but now I can say that, you know, in England, they're really trying and I'm seeing people like myself on the TV, different types of families, you know, different disabilities. So they, they're trying, but I, yeah. they're doing it out of um, realizing that things need to change and not doing it just to tick the boxes. That's, that's one of the things that I, I, you know, I'm wary about. Are you just yeah. doing it? To tick the boxes basically you well, know did this... the Sainsbury's ad from years ago the Christmas ad that had a black family on the Sainsbury's ad that upset so many people was that ticking a box or was that trying to change I, Sainsbury's, change? I would say possibly at the beginning it might have been ticking the box but there are some supermarkets and some some of the you know that I feel that it's genuine now yeah you know I feel that it's genuine because if you did see a couple it would always be a mixed you know a mixed couple black black man or a white woman as a couple you never saw two black people as a couple with a family yeah. so it's really lovely and enlightening and I know recently they had one and it was a bit of an uproar because there was a Muslim you know they were a Muslim family in one of the adverts celebrating Christmas and that was a bit of an uproar as well so from which communities all of them i think so yes <laughs> at the same time, celebrate it's like, christmas but the, you know what I, anyway you know again i've you know i've got such a mixture of friends a wide variety of friends and so does my daughter so yeah. she's got friends that don't celebrate christmas but they still put the christmas tree up they still you know it might not mean as but then to be honest with you a lot of people that are christian or what they don't even follow the faith here anyway to be no. honest with you they're, they're just, just doing it. the presence <laughs> yes when I go to church I don't see a lot of English people to be honest with yeah. you when I it depends like a Catholic church you will see but there's certain religions it's not as you know I know so yeah. many English people that have never been baptized or christened or whatever you want. they they they're not a believer believe you know but that's another story altogether no. but then the uproar about who was celebrating Christmas yeah. so I for Viola, I really felt what she was going through in many ways. So I really wanted to go to the part where, you know, she said that when she was running away from school, I was being hunted. And what a feeling that must be for a little girl. Like, I don't know that feeling. I don't know the no. feeling of, of fearing for my life. And I love that how she didn't hide the fact that her mum gave her a crochet needle to stand up for herself and the way she described it is you know her mother had all these children she hasn't got time to go protecting you 
you need to learn how to protect yourself. And her mother said, don't come back here crying about those boys or I'll whoop your ass. Yeah. Um, and yeah. she says, they mess with you, you jug them. <laughs> and, and you know, that's, that's what you had to do back in the days. You had to protect yourself. And you had to protect your children. Yeah. Um, and being sort of one of the youngest, you know, you find down the line, it's like, you know, you're not, you're not the sort of like protected mother as you used to be. It's like, right, this is how you deal with it, you know, yeah. and, and, and that's what, the, that's what you would do. And I suppose with, you know, me growing up, um, yeah, we always defended ourselves. Yeah. We, we go to our parents, it's like, we'll defend ourselves and we might say something and they'll just say, don't let anyone get the better of you, you know, stand your ground. Yeah. Where, very different now in this this generation to be honest yes. with you but we had to stand our ground but again I've never had that feeling of being chased um I just think it must be awful because you know as a black woman I can feel the fear that she has I've not had that fear of feeling you know being chased because of my color and and because of the, the complexion of my color yeah. but again you know different environment different country um racism and discrimination I mean is is very open in America and even though it might be in the UK it's very undercover yeah but then I suppose it depended on the environment and the area that you were in because I was a minority as such in my school it was a nice mix mm. but then mm. some people that it's been a minority yeah yeah it's really hard it's hard just knowing that there's this other black boy who is chasing her, who's leading these black, these white, white boys. It's quite interesting. And she turns you know? around and says, you're black too. Yes. And he did not know how to respond. No. He has must, fear so he is face. running away. Yes. He was running away from his true color. He was running away. And that must have really hit home because he was speechless. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And then he just because turned around and there are black on Portuguese. And it's sad because it's like, it's again, there's a lot of people that don't want to, especially if you're black or you're Asian, you know, you sometimes people have this thing of not identifying with their, their culture and their ethnicity. Cause there are people out there where they've got, you know, they just don't want, they want to be white. Yeah. They want yeah. to be white. But I remember even for myself, I rejected being an Italian for years because I looked at the my friends who had white families whose parents didn't raise their voices that ha they had a lot more freedom that I than I did and then I looked at my loud crazy strict family and to be honest not a lot of really good male role models throughout the history of my family so it it just it made me want to reject it and I was teased for being Italian. So one one time I, well, twice I've punched boys. Once was in defense of my sister. And it's the second one was a boy holding me up in um, a doorway and calling me wog. And I just grabbed him and I just went bang, bang in his stomach because I was Good. bigger than him. He was the blondest, Good, whitest boy in the school. And he left me alone after that. So there you go. So I used it as a little girl. I had to use violence. And it's sad because, you know, in this day and age, they tell kids, you know, do not hit back, do not do this. But, you know, who, who are they saying that to? Because when it's people of colour, you know, you know, you're constantly, you, you know, how do you defend your battle? Yeah. You know, back in the days, it was fists, not guns, not knives. It was fists and, and verbal, you know, that yeah. you're defending yourself. Yeah. Uh, knitting needle was quite shocking, but then I get it. Yeah. I get it. And in a way, it's relatable to a lot of young people, which I don't agree with, who carry knives because they're defending themselves. Mm. It's so sad that it's, it's still there, but on a different level, um, you know, defending yourself. Why should we, even in that time, have to be defending ourselves because of the color that you are, because of the shade that you are? You know, that age, she was five, wasn't she? Yeah, was it five? Like that, six, yeah. I mean, five, six, imagine you're going to school. I remember my happy days of going to school. Mm. I was safe, I, you know, um, I, I, I was happy in my environment. 
So imagine, you know, school and going to school is meant to be your safe haven, you know, to educate, to learn, but all there for one purpose. But yet you're going to school in fear, you know, or like, you, you know, like, you know, at the end of the day for me, it's like, yeah, going home, gonna have dinner, gonna play out. But her fear is, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to run home to get away from these boys who are. I can. And she said, I had never stopped running. My feet just stopped moving. And when Will That's Smith powerful. asked her, who are you? She didn't know how to answer. And Will Smith turned around to her and said, I'm still that heartbroken, you know, boy young boy that's what he carries inside him a lot which is interesting considering his relationship with his wife or ex-wife to be I can't keep up with those two oh um, I don't know I I don't follow (laughs) um but then Viola said she's still that little girl running and and like I said to you I'm still that little girl defending my sister and protecting the underdog in every situation because I grew up with a sister who always was the underdog, you know, having a disability, she was always the last to be picked or the, the one who had the least expectations or, the, or, you know, people didn't bother with her. You know, she wasn't a person in com- no. completely to so many people. And it's just, it's just sad, really. I mean, I think what I, I, I loved in a way about my up, up, upbringing is you know the strength of my parents so despite the discrepancy of you know their relationship because obviously they divorced you know many years later once we've all grown up but what I loved about my my upbringing and I can say that my childhood was a happy one because of the strength of my mother and my father and my mum you know mums are great they're loving we we deal with things with our emotions but I did like the strength of my father you know because one of the things that he did say to me is, and, and it's sad because, you know, as black people and, you know, whether you're African, African-American, whether you're the Car- well, Caribbean, it's a little bit different when you're living in the Caribbean, but when you're living in like the UK and America, you know, um, you have the talk. There's the talk that you have. And I can recall there was a situation with a friend of mine who is white and her children are white. And I think the kid had used, might have used the word black and everyone was like, oh, you know, and, or he said something which wasn't wrong, but like she felt really upset that she had to go and give him the talk, this talk about, you know, certain words that you say and so forth and whatever. And she said she felt really bad, you know, he's only how, how old. And I'm thinking, but this is, as soon as our kids are a certain age, you give them the talk. I've done it with my daughter. But my talk is a positive talk. Like my dad, I remember saying to him, him saying to me, I don't know whether he said it to my siblings, and you know, they're they're three, you know, I've got three brothers. Um, but it was like nobody, he didn't put the colour in, but I remember him saying, You've got, got to love yourself. Nobody is better than you. You come first. So for me, I, I, car- I held my head high, my back, you know, strong and erect, you know, carried my shoulders with confidence. I've always carried myself with confidence, even when I was, the, you know, the shy, quiet one. Yeah. I always had this confidence. And I'd say that car- has carried through with my siblings as well, because we know our worth and you've met them. Mm. So, you know, we're very confident. We're a very confident family in who we are. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm confident in my skin. I'm confident in the upbringing that I have. I'm confident in everything that I do. So, and I love me. I absolutely love me. Okay. And I wouldn't want to be anything else. I love my color. I just love me. I love my hair. I wish I had that talk too. Pardon? Where was my talk? That sounds like a great talk because it took me a well, it was. lot longer to love me. Well, I've always loved myself in that respect with regards to my colour. And I have to say that, you know, I've seen friends, I've had friends, we have friends of all shades. And obviously I love the black culture because we, you know, black people wear all shades of brown. It's just great, right? There's a spectrum. We're so unique. And, um, but I have had friends who are darker skins than me and 
you know, the words that people would be called and how they would, you know, the insecurities that they had. Yeah. So when my daughter was born, um, she was darker skinned, but it's not, you know, it's just because we are, we don't know what co- complexion our children are going to come out, but we're black at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned. So I made sure that my daughter loved herself yeah. and it was, but, you know, you know, so, you know, she's a lovely chocolate brown, you know, um, you know, we, we like there's a spectrum. We've got a spectrum of nephews and nieces, you know, so it's like dark chocolate, milk chocolate, you know, white, yeah, yeah. You know, a lovely, yeah. but it, they all love themselves. And then your mum's a bit caramel. Yes. You know, we all, you know, they all love themselves. Mm. And my daughter is so confident you know I said to her what is there that you would change about your body and this was when she was much younger you know maybe about 12 or so I said oh, I'm not, actually I might ask her the same question but I said what would you change what would you want to change about you what do, first of all it's like what do you love about you and she told me all the things that she loved about herself and I said what would you change she's like oh, I don't really like my toes <laughs> you know <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, I don't really want to wear, you know, my toes are a bit skinny. But, you know, that was the only thing. And because I've raised, I've, I've carried that on, that nobody is better than you. You respect others, you know, and others will respect you. But do not belittle yourself. Do not feel that you are, because you might be a minority in some of the situations that you're in, whether it's school and whatever, love yourself. Know your worth. Yeah. So I've never had problems about being a black woman or a black little girl, about the color of my skin. The only thing that used to worry me is I had eczema. That's what used to worry me, you know, but my, I've always been happy within. Yeah. And I would say that with, with all my siblings as well. So my parents did a very good job. Yeah. You know, um, they did a very good job because you've got like my dad who is darker skinned and then you've got my, my mum who's fair skinned and they've yeah. made up nice little mix and but they made us strong and believe in who we are and know our worth and know that we can achieve whatever we can so to hear you know this poor you know in America I just think it was very very deep very very even more so with the colorism I mean it does go on here but it was the treatment it's just so yeah so and I and you know to finish off um the first chapter she really listened and she really woke up when her therapist turned around and said that little girl survived and there you go. she learned that she's going to carry that little girl with her and and I just want to read this she said the final stretch to finding me would be allowing that eight-year-old girl in actively inviting her into every moment of my current existence to experience the joy she so longed for. And I guess that's part of me doing this podcast. I am now get to interview the underdog, the people who, you know, may have had um, a tough start or may have, you know, hit a wall with diversity or being included. So I, I get to be that little girl that is still wanting to protect and love those protect. people and yes. to bring them to, to bring them forward and to celebrate them. Exactly. And it is about celebration at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what colour, shade, ethnicity, religion, whatever you are, it's about celebrating. We're just so, you know, we are amazing human beings and we're all here for a purpose. We've all got a purpose on this earth. And I think it's about living your best life and appreciating the, you know, the, the, the variety of things out there. You know, we will go and we will have like these amazing, you, you know, you can make an egg how many different ways and we enjoy it. So why can't we enjoy each other, yeah. you know, in, in, in the way that we are and the way that we're formed and, and just on all different levels? You know, someone asked me years ago, um, if you could make Tanya normal, um, would you? So... In other words, to stop having Down syndrome. And I said, no, why would no. I? No. I said, but, but then no. she'll have a normal life. And I'm like, what's a normal life? I said, she gets to have <laughs> love, joy, music. She doesn't have to pay any bills. She doesn't have to worry about the war over here. And, you know, she doesn't have. 
she's no, in that her was, own she's, she's got a life she's of happy. her own <laughs> exactly yeah. what is normal yeah. what is normal in each each person and in each home and all our there's no normal from the you know what is normal I mean I, I think people use that you know working in a special needs school oh my gosh the diversity not just in in how they looked but you know the, the different spectrums and the disabilities that they have and but the quirks every, and the characters students oh my gosh their characters never the same yeah every day was a different day yeah. but the love and the respect that I have for them and I'm sure you know I got it back from them I did get it back from them as well yeah. it really shows and why would you change such an amazing character I mean of, of these these young people why would you do that the only thing I would change if they is if they're in pain that's all exactly yeah. exactly that's all you don't want anyone to be in pain and that's all yeah you know to be you know and just to be happy and just be protected that's all you want really yeah um you know and that's just for everybody yeah just live a happy life as best you know not even happy just you know like like Viola she has you know if you, you know obviously we've just started reading this book and already we're seeing and feeling what she's gone through as a child and at the, you know I can't wait to read the middle because obviously we can see how she has done so well but take all that away take away you know her being a, a famous actress and you know, you know have having a lot of wealth now compared to what she had before that's not really important no. you know that is not really take those away she's still like many other people a person yeah you know a person you know strip all those those are just like little um little notches you know yeah. little achievements but that doesn't make you the person who you are no. And did you, do you remember what she said about her mum? She says she loves looking at her mum and her mum's skin and all her scars. And, you know, she sees her mum's story on her and know, and sees her as this beautiful, strong survivor, you know. Of exactly. So much. And I think exactly. They're, they're her battle scars. Exactly. Exactly. And we all have them. We, it doesn't matter what colour you are, you know, we look up to our, our, you know, you look up to our parents, you know, we look up, you know, we, ex we are what our parents are. Those are the ones that educate us when we first come into this world. We might not all be born with a silver spoon in our mouths, but we always, no matter how poor you are or how rich you are, you look at how your parents go through day-to-day um, -day living, the battles that they face, how they get out of it. I think more than how they deal with things that may not be um, great, you know, be, you know, we talk about happy and sad, but we have to have, we've got to have these emotions and, you know, and, you know, it's about survival at the end of the day. Yeah. It's about survival. Um, you know, she's come from a very poor background. Yeah. And, you know, the one thing that she's so far that we've read, you know, we, we're hearing the strength of her mother. Um, a few chapters down, she starts to talk about a particular sister. Mm. You know, it's just nice because again, it's not about your surroundings; it's about the people that you are with. Yeah, it makes you, you. You could be in a mansion, but you could be surrounded by a family that have values that are just not going to shape you into a wonderful person. Exactly, it doesn't. Yeah it's not that lived experience yeah yeah because you might live you might be living in a mansion and you go out there and you really see the real world mm. what impact might that have on them yeah yeah so this is it's 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 yeah so her mother was beaten at school and she was beaten at school by a lighter skinned skinned black teacher who, and she says, who was suffering from the interracial disease of colorism. And it's, and I, you know, and then she said, you know, that her grandmother had nappy hair. And I'm like, what is nappy hair? Do you understand what that is? Uh, do you know what? It's, to be honest with you, I, it's really funny. And I, and again, I, you sort of wonder where it stems from, but I'm sort of tired of like, 
being a black person, you know, hair and skin color is always an emphasis. And it's really sad because those are the words that you would read or how we would be described um, back in the days when I was at school and I was doing geography and uh, yeah, you know, it's more or less all white girls, you know, school. And um, I remember we were reading about different nationalities. Oh my gosh, I wish I'd kept that book, you know, um, but that would have been stealing. But, um, you know, but it had, when they were describing black people, it was just ridiculous. It was like, what was it? Because I remember me and my black friends were like, it, it's quite degrading. It's like, you know, they would describe the white person but they sounded all out angelic and it was the words that they described. I'm just, you know, it yeah. was just, you know, but then it was like, what's it? Um, the black people, um, they call, the script, woolly hair and um, uh, what's it? Full lips or big lips, but it was like, it was the way they described the lips and then the way they described our noses. But as you know, our lips are all different. Again, you know, some might have fuller lips Did than they the other. Did have a description of white lips so, and white noses? Well, how they too. described it, it was like, um, you know, it was more like perfectly formed lips, you know, um, you know, uh, straight nose. But then with the black, when they were describing it, I must actually speak to some of my school friends. It wasn't very nice. Yeah. Like, really? You know, I, I remember we were all like, really? We were quite strong back then, actually. And I think we did sort of raise the issue about the way that black people were described but this book I mean this was in the 80s yeah um, god knows how long ago that book was written to be honest oh, with you yes, yes. and say so, you know there's always been an issue because again it's always basing beauty on the white man you know the white woman the straight hair and and so forth but I must say that you know there's a lot of us that are happy for who we are you know we love our hair and when you look at it you know everybody wants to have you know cornrows and you know hair like us and you know all the surgery now with the full lips and the bottoms and you know because I remember you know and you know black girls and black women they have you know curvaceous and it's just how our bodies were formed yeah. and then you know it was totally different from the white girls that I used to go to school with you know but now all of a sudden I'm seeing white people with butts and you know fuller lips than mine and I'm like what is going on and then yeah. to be again you know tanned um or, or, or a darker brown and it's like but yeah at the same time you know you're giving us all this trouble and, and this whole race and racist things it's just <laughs> interesting but everybody always resorts back but and I'm sure Viola's seeing that now you know because back then being black was like you know black you know it's embarrassing the dark you are it's embarrassing it's really bad on your mental health you know people talk about mental health but we are living it as black people we are living it every day every day and it's and it's like so they're talking about all these mental health things that are going on and I'm thinking are you guys serious you know our parents and grandparents have gone through and great great grandparents have gone through struggles that is meant how how have they survived it mm. how how have they how strong are we yeah. how strong is viola yeah and how joyous is she and how joyous is your mother you know like exactly they don't carry it with them they've been through no. all that struggle and i and i got to meet grand grand your grandmother you know so much joy they didn't they, exactly you know where i have met a lot of old people who have had struggle and a bitter old people but I've never been a in your family not at all no I mean my gran love her to bits may she rest in peace but you know she did say there's some things that she will never ever discuss with us you know and I kind of respect it but at the same time I was really trying to dig deep um, especially when her father died when they were young and the struggles. And obviously back then it wasn't about the colour, because obviously, you know, she's from the Caribbean, was born in the Caribbean, but it was more about where the man is the breadwinner and the woman is, yeah. you know, looked after the family at home. So it was more the struggles that she, you know, she, she, you know, not having that father figure in her life and yeah. obviously loved her father. Um, so, but she just, she, she, it died with her. She just didn't, you know, she said, as soon as my dad died, 
um, you know, that it, it things changed. So that was the struggle of not having that powerful man, you know, running the home. Uh, but at the same time, she speaks so greatly of her, her great her grandparents and um, her mother. So again, it's always the strength. And, you know, the one thing my grandmother said, because even with Viola, when she was talking, um, which chapter was it when they moved and they were living in those apartments? Yeah, and, great. You know, yeah. The, the, yeah. No electricity, the yeah. water, just, it was just so awful. Yeah. 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 And what my grandmother, you know, I will quote from her. She said, you know, it doesn't matter what type of home you're living in. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, the house is big or small or, you know, you're rich or poor. She goes, it's down to how you make it a home. Yeah. How you make it. It's, it's you know, don't you, it's how you make it a home. Yeah. yeah. So and, and that that resonates with me a lot. You know, you don't have a lot of things to have a happy home, yeah. to have a supportive home to have a strong home, yeah. you know, you don't have to have a look, it's about the actual family, your siblings, your mother, your father, that's your home, not the material things. Yeah, and, you know, in Chapter 3, they do, um, she talks about when her sister comes to visit and her sister points out life doesn't always have to be like this. There is more Which life. Which lovely. Yeah. Which was, and open again. her eyes. It does. So even though she was very young and she said she didn't quite understand it, but she felt it, you know, when her sister was saying, you know, obviously whispering. So her mum didn't hear because her mum's doing the best that she can do. And it's that era and that time. Yeah. It sort of said, you know, you do know you can have, you know, you can have better. Your life is not going to always be like that. It's just like my dad saying, no one is better than you. Love yourself. Having those strong words at such a young age, it, it makes a difference yeah. in how you go forward in life. And, and, that, well, and that may have resulted, if she didn't have those words with Viola, you know, you wonder, would Viola have then entered the cycle of poverty where it's generation after generation? Because exactly. If you look on, um, you go onto Google Maps or you go on to look at... Um, pictures of you know that area in South Carolina it is still poor it is still run down it's not a um, there's no beautiful buildings there from what I can see when I've been trying to look around on maps and things yes so it would be very easy and it's still as I said in the year 2000 it's still five percent black so you're still a minority there so I wonder what would have happened to Viola if she didn't um, have those dreams and have that awakening you know exactly. what happened there was one bit there when they talked about um you know how the home that they were they moved into it was infested with rats I mean that was just awful because I hate mice and the rats Don't, were eating a dog because they're outside but to know that rats are in your home yes was like oh my god Oprah said even Oprah said oh we didn't go into the kitchen at night because all the rats would be around it's just the thought of it you know and I just think, oh my gosh and she, so she mentioned that every single one of them were bedwetters yeah. so I went teacher mode and that whole, what was causing them to bedwet would it be because the fear of the rats around the poverty would it be, you know, they didn't want to get up and use the toilet because they, you know, you know, once you're in your bed, you just want to stay there. Was it the upbringing, you know, maybe what they saw in the home? Because obviously we haven't gone deep. Well, we've seen a bit about what's been going on with, you know, with the well, dad. Some and people it's sexual abuse too, but there's no talk of that. No, that's what I'm saying. She's not, we've not heard it yet, but she's not mentioned any sexual abuse. But, you know, not all the time is bedwetting sexual abuse. No. So it's, I'm, I'm you know, I, it, the fact that all of them were bedwetters, you know, what what was the reason for that? Maybe it know? is fear of getting out of bed. Yeah. Because in my head, it didn't come, I didn't think that there was like um, any, yeah. I For me, the first thing was, was it the rats? It wasn't, <laughs> I didn't think about anything else. No, I didn't think of that. <laughs> I didn't I didn't think on that note of you know um, abuse I just thought is it because all these rats were running riot in that home yeah. and fit, you know and just just staying in your bed and you're cold yes. another thing though there may not have been sexual abuse 
but there was violence in yes, the house. Yes, there was. There was. So um, in Chapter 3, she talks about her, her father's demons um, and her father had, um, he believed in the haints, which are the evil spirits and the ghosts. And it's interesting because my grandmother did some of these things. So it says father made haints present in their lives. So every time they'd pass a gravestone, they'd have to cross themselves. Otherwise, the person in that grave couldn't rest yeah. in peace. My grandmother, whenever we would drive past the cemetery, she would make us hold a button of any type. Oh, really? Because I remember people would just sort of do that whole, you know. Yeah. I, that, but, yeah. But there was always, he made sure that they knew that there were ghosts around them at all times. So between that and the the violence between mum and dad, maybe that's another reason for bedwetting as well. Mm, it's true because, I mean, I think it was in Chapter 2, um, there is a bit where um, the dad's um, something to do with a glass and he yeah. sort of flashed it on her mum's face. Yes. And then, you know, because she's always been, because obviously she, I think the young, she was the only one, she was the one that was there, wasn't it? And the yeah. old were out and yeah. she kind of got in the way. She thought, you know, she Stopped remembered him. Her, and her siblings, the sister said to her, if mum and dad, you know, go in and try and sort of, what's it, stop it or try and sort of not yeah. let it escalate. So yeah. again, having that burden as a little girl, yeah. you know, in the side of their dad, um because it was he an alcoholic I think did he drink uh yes yes yes, yes. he payday. drank he was a, he was an alcoholic yeah and you know again you look at the black man you know the man who is going through struggles he's meant to be the breadwinner of the family and he's meant to be you know and sometimes you know that he imagine live, knowing that you've got five children living in this this accommodation living in this this place and you can't do anything about it as, as the head of the home. And he was getting paid rubbish as a horse trainer or... Which is... Rubbish. And look how much they get paid now. Yeah. As horse trainers. Mm. You know, look... But also, do you, do you remember when she said she went to see her father's work? And he yes. was so proud showing the horses yes. and everything. But then when the owner came in, she said she that he spoke. Dad and suddenly he kind of behaved like he was that man's slave. Yes, yes, she did use that and word. Behavior. That slave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's sad that in that those times, that feeling of using the word slave, you know, she's actually used that word where in the UK, in me growing up, I can't ever recall my parents in a workplace saying that's how they felt. Yeah. So, again, the treatment so different to a certain extent. But a lot uh, of the British slavery didn't happen on British soil. It was... No, it didn't. They were very crafty. What they yeah. did, slavery, it was against the law to have slaves in England, but they did all their dirty work in the Caribbean islands in America. So, yeah, they're very, you know, that's so that way. It, you know, so it's like, oh, no, but, it, you know there was no slaves in England you know everyone was free didn't matter what color you are so they did their dirty work outside yeah but so obviously it wasn't slaves that built all the buildings in England it it was it was black people building it was black people building but I would say they weren't they weren't enslaved no but um in in England I yes they were they weren't called, quite called slaves because obviously you had the Irish as well yeah. um but obviously they were paid maybe, you know, pennies, but they they literally built England, yeah. yes. Yeah. But slavery, they did not practice slavery in England, but they practised it outside. Well, they certainly practised the class system. Well, again, that's, you know, yes. It still yeah. goes on. Because there's a difference, like, you know, you've got, like, when you look at the records, you've got, like, slave, like, you've got black, you've got mulatto, so you've got like mulatto, which is obviously, I think, you know, the fairest skin, maybe you were born, you've got the mulattoes, you've got the blacks, and it was a some, but it meant um, those it up. Africa, on. those were born in, um, that were actually born enslaved. It, there's, there was a difference of what they were, when they were recorded on the, the, the um, birth certificates and things like that. 
I've only got the Italian word for mal for malato, <laughs> which means That'd be sick. interesting. Malato, it means you're sick. Hold oh, on. really? Yeah. But I've read. The time is just right. A T T O, the first yes. generation offspring of a black person and a white person. First but then, first generation. But have a look coming together. Because there was an R, ah, it was it coloured, it was different, it was different. And it's also usually an offensive term, a person of mixed white and black ancestry. What an so yeah. mixed race means mulatto? Pardon? Is it does it mean mixed race? Mulatto. Mixed race, yes, mixed race is mulatto. So the slave master, you know, having their so they way. They would have been a step up from Yes, they would have, but they would have worked in the house, in the homes. Yeah. And then they did it ranking. So then they felt that they were better than the field slaves. Yeah. Didn't your yeah. mom or your grandma say that one of their siblings is lighter skin and she got to work in a shop? Oh, that's my auntie. So back in the days, um, when in the Caribbean islands, so I can only speak for, for Barbados, um, you know, and I suppose in general, but, you know, when you used to go to the banks and the super, you know, the big banks and like the department stores, if you had one, um, it was always white people that worked in there, the white, you know, people on the island. And then when black people started to go filter in, um, they would only employ those that were very fair skinned. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so you would never see somebody my color or darker um, working in 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 those sort of environments, but you know that's changed it's now. It's such a shock for a white person to see someone so dark. My God, ridiculous! It's ridiculous. But you know, and even though yeah, even though they're a small percentage, but obviously with Barbados, we were the pilot of slavery. We were the island that they piloted it from first. God. Yeah, it's quite deep. Yeah, I think we need to learn that history too. Mm. Um, yeah, and I remember when Roots came out back in the 70s and, you know, that's you seeing it for the first time visually, Slaves, and watching that movie, that just, I, I, mean, I remember all the black kids at school really like kind of going to the white people, oh, you know, you can't do that to us now kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 you, could, you try and you'll get beaten up. So we were like the strong ones, like, yeah, yeah, that, you, that might happen then, but not now, you know, we're yeah. the strong you come, you come try and, you know, um, yeah. test us and we'll beat the hell out of you sort of thing. I'll be, um, I'll be packing a knitting needle. No. <laughs> well, yeah, there'll be fists, there'll be fights, fight, 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 fight. Oh. We don't use the N-word. It wasn't something that I grew up in. I think it's very much, again, an American thing. So the experiences are so different. The ex you know, the Black experience is so different yeah. to an extent, but it still stems, we still face that whole divide. Yeah regardless yeah yeah all right so let's read from a four to eight chapters four to eight and uh yeah we'll we'll uh engage yeah. in a wonderful chat about that too thank you so much for definitely thank you and I think what I might do is when I read I'll do a bit like you because you're a bit better than me you went and did that whole research thing <laughs> so what I'm going to do is make sure that any little thing that resonates with me or something that I've read from a book um, I will then try and see if I can. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, sort of, we're both yeah. educators, so uh, um, you know, yes, yes. I think you were a bit more in depth than me today. <laughs> it's all good. Experienced on the podcast. <laughs> and we are very grateful for to Viola for sharing her story. Yes. It really, even and you know me as a, a white person, it resonates with me too on so many levels, and it really opens up my eyes to I, I've never known or I've never heard someone's lived experience of, of that sort of poverty, especially in America. But, you know, yes. I mean, I don't think I've known any well-known Black people to talk about how poor they were. Actually, you're right. Yeah. Oh, no. no, she's really going deep. Yeah. She's really opening up and being honest about what she's gone through. And I think this is such a good inspiration for the younger generation, because I'm really at the moment, you know, this whole black on black crime, it just does my head in. Yeah. The one thing I could say that her time and during, you know, 
the other times way way back I'm sure they weren't killing each other they were supporting each other exactly Exactly. so I think this is a book that again this should be one of the books that should be read um you know books like these should be a part of our history maybe she needs Lessons. to be part of Black History Month yes Why we not? should be month which should be in our curriculum it should just be Black History it should just be a part of history it's just That's a part of history Colourful we shouldn't history. even put any names on it it's history with everybody included in it. <laughs> exactly. We need to stop it. doing that whole label. It's that sharing our history. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. You know, you get tired of saying black, black, black. You know, it's like know. my experience, my lived experience, you know. What's, and then, what's, what's stopping me from saying I feel like I'm just in the, a, another shade of the spectrum? You talked about black being a spectrum. Can I just be another shade along the whole spectrum? Well, so that's what I'm saying. Way wider than me. I'm way darker than him. <laughs> it's I just, just you know to what? be called white, completely white when I'm apparently I'm, old you know, skinned. <laughs> that is one of the things. But then, you know, I've had this discussion before because I would say, oh, like, you know, my friends, you know, who are like Italian or Spanish, but then they're seen as white. Yeah. But even though, but the lived, ex, it, you, it's still a different experience. Yeah, it is. You yeah. know, some black people might say, yeah, but they're white. You know, as soon as they step out on the street, they don't need to speak. They don't need to do anything. So they're not, they're still treated differently because they are a lighter shade. Do you know, said, the only time I ever felt like I was a darker shade, I mean, apart from being teased when I was little, but going in and out of America, and ah. out of England, I would get stopped and searched a lot. Are you serious? And, and have to go and stand in that thing and have them scan my whole body. And when I was in America, my friend looked at me and she said, is it because you're a bit darker? Is it because you, they think you're maybe Hispanic or Mexican or, you know? And I was like, oh, because I had dark hair then. And, you know, it looked very Italian or very, you know, dark then. I'm like, oh, maybe, because she never got pulled up at all. Mm. So it's the only time that I was like, oh, maybe in some other parts of the world I am a, a different, in a different category or group or label yeah. or something. I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, it, but I, yeah, don't feel, it's just... I don't feel like I'm a white person. To me, that, that trends in my brain, that's, British or that, that's interesting that white, Scandinavian it's there that's very so that's nice. how you see because then you've got you know our Polish friend she's yeah. faced discrimination yeah she's white yeah she's whiter than is she whiter than me yeah I'd say so yes yes she is yeah. you, yes you know and it's interesting because then I would explain to certain people, but they've experienced it's a little bit different. You, you know, you know, some black people aren't said, but they're white. And I get it. I get, you know, because we're talking about skin tone. Yeah. But it's then where you're from. And it always stems to, but I'm not British. I'm not English. Yeah. Because they don't English. I'm not English. English doesn't be in white. Mm. So it's a very interesting. Um, that's another well, story. Before the next time I speak to you, I'm going to go down to the hardware store and find out exactly what colour I am. All right, I'm going to get the colour chart. <laughs> I out. should as well. I'm going to come back to you. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Look, you must And then be I'm going to create knackered. a new box on every single form I fill out. <laughs> this it's is true. What I am. Well, it, it, it annoys me here because when I'm, you're filling out, and again, it was the white man who created your the ethnicity list in England. Yeah. Because I'm Oh, it's at least it's stronger African, you know, African -Amer American, you know, straight away black, whatever. But they could Afro, Afro Caribbean, that gripes me. Afro for me is a hairstyle, okay. So the tick box is Afro, Afro Caribbean. Does that mean black Caribbean? What does Afro mean? This is what I'm saying. I mean, I've not looked. At, I've not done a, um, a, a. But when you're ticking, back in the days, it would have Afro Caribbean. I must look at some of the things now because now it, it's like they do black. You know, it's like it, they might do black British or or 
Black, British, I can't remember, Caribbean. So that now I'm ticking boxes where it says Caribbean, but Black, Brit it's stupid. It's, it's just too much. I, I don't like the word Afro because that's when it started off. I think Maybe they just need to have a colour chart, just circle where you... <laughs> exactly. It's like, oh, but then does it really matter? I mean, I, know, I, I think in a way from the time they started doing that, that was when your discrimination was even more so because I used to be able to get a job and they didn't know whether I was black, white or, or whatever the case would be because obviously having a, an English name. Yeah. Um, now it's like they know already what colour and shade you are, which is stupid, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I used to like going in to an interview or like I turn up and it's like the shock on their face. <laughs> like, <yes. laughs> I've had that a few times and even you can yeah. With my, with my brothers with their names especially the one that you spoke to earlier because that's such an old white man's name <laughs> and uh, you know he's had a, he's got a few stories to tell with that it's quite funny he's actually his middle all his middle names he's like such an old white man's name it's quite funny Lisa. thanks for joining thank me. you goodbye and see you until next time okay all right <laughs> yeah all right take it easy bye, bye.